Good morning, everyone. First of all, thanks uh, so much to everyone for coming. If there's anybody who wants to be a little bit more comfortable, have some elbow room. There's empty seats up front. Uh, encourage you to move forward. Um, uh, I'm fairly certain none of our speakers bite, so it should be, should be safe. Uh, I'm Peter Scosi, Executive Vice President for the Metropolitan Planning Council. Welcome to uh, this, e this afternoon's event on bus rapid transit. Uh, sold out crowd today, so I'm surprised to see some empty seats, but maybe some few more will trickle in. Um, this is just one of, of many events that MPC holds. We call them roundtables. The intent is really to discuss policy issues that MPC is working on uh, and to bring them out into the public for some debate and for some discussion and education. And to then at some point in the program, as we will again today, get you all involved. Uh, so hence the roundtable format. Um, back when I started at MPC in 1996, we actually did hold these, there, there were so few people in attendance, we actually did get to sit around a round table. So we had to switch up the format a bit. Um, so uh, today we've got uh, four great speakers who I'll get to introducing in a moment, but if you uh, want to glance at their bios, they are on the handouts on your chairs as well. Um, the, the work that you're going to hear about today is also part of a, of a larger effort around bus rapid transit in the city of Chicago, which a steering committee has been leading. Uh, the Metropolitan Planning Council is pleased to be a part of that steering committee, but there are many other members uh, on that steering committee as well. The folks that you see, that you will be hearing from today, certainly our official um, CDOT and CTA partners are part of that steering committee. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation has provided generous support to that steering committee, but also the Chicago Architecture Foundation is here today. Active Transportation Alliance is a member of that steering committee. Um, the Urban Land Institute, Chicago, uh, and I know I'm forgetting one more. Oh, Civic Consulting Alliance, of course. Um, so we make up, we, we meet regularly and we talk about how to promote bus rapid transit, uh, for both from a, a, a design perspective and get community engagement, and also around some of the media outreach that we've done as well. Um, if you are so inclined to participate in some of that media uh, dispersal, dispersion, uh, we are live tweeting today, and you can tweet at, uh, at BRT, or the little hashtag BRT Chicago. That hashtag is good anytime uh, for today's event, but also any other time you might be walking around on the street and want to do a BRT-related tweet, for those of you so inclined. Anybody BRT-related tweet just spontaneously hit you today? Anyone? Just want to get it out there? Um, <laughs> if you follow Gabe, you get those kinds of things all the time. Um, MPC is particularly interested in bus rapid transit, not just because it's a new transportation enhancement that can move people, uh, but because it really does have the ability to transform the communities through which it runs. So we have, a, a, for example, a large placemaking program. Uh, we are excited to see how the stations around BRT stops can themselves become public spaces, can become vibrant places and hubs in the community. Uh, we are excited to see how land use can be shaped by new BRT lines, um, developing higher density near nodes like we see developed around some of our train stations in the city. So BRT is much more, for, to MPC, is much more than just moving people. It's really about developing communities. On that station side, I want to just acknowledge the Chicago Architecture Foundation has a station design competition coming up. Um, CAF is, there we go. If uh, Ingrid's over here on the edge, if anyone is interested in getting information about how to participate in that or, or um, want to just find out when the results are going to be released, please see Ingrid uh, for some more details. So first, I'm going to be uh, we're going to be leading off with a sort of what's going on in the city of Chicago with BRT today. And CTA and CDOT, our speakers from CTA and CDOT will be doing that. First is going to be Rebecca Scheinfeld with the CTA. Uh, Rebecca is the chief planning officer at CTA. I first met Rebecca actually when we were working uh, on the mayor's transition committee, um, writing some the report around transportation and infrastructure. And uh, we were pleased that BRT was, was elevated as one of the final recommendations in that transition committee report. Uh, and then lo and behold, she got hired by the CTA to, to get it done. So be careful what you promote, right? Uh, and then Gabe Klein, who was formerly with the uh, Department of uh, Transportation in Washington, D.C., um, is, is somewhat new to Chicago as well, but has been a terrific champion for BRT since he got started, since he hit the ground running here. Uh, and so Gabe will be talking. And this has really been, I, I would say, a, a, 
in my experience in Chicago, a tremendously unique partnership, not only between the CTA and CDOT uh, in terms of planning and executing this, but the way that the civic organization has been brought, organizations have been brought into the fold and uh, allowed to be part of the process. So I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca first. Um, she might want to come up here to the podium and have her give you her remarks. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm gonna start with an overview of the various projects we have underway in terms of what is happening with BRT in Chicago, and then I'll be passing it on to Commissioner Klein, who will sp speak more in depth about the Central Loop BRT project downtown. So I'm gonna kind of leave some of the details out on that in comparison, and there'll be plenty of time to talk about that. So first of all, I think many of you are probably already familiar with bus rapid transit, but just as a, a reminder and for those new to the concept, what is bus rapid transit? So we talk about bus rapid transit as a way to have faster, more efficient, more reliable bus service, but in a way that acts more like a train. So it's getting the reliability and speed of rail with the efficiency and flexibility of a bus without needing as much of the heavy construction investment as you would for an extended <coughs> Um, heavy rail system. So what are some of the, how does this get expressed? What are some of the different features that you see in BRT around the world, really? Um, first is dedicated bus lanes. Now, in Chicago, we have bus lanes around the city, but they aren't necessarily well respected or well marked. Um, this, with BRT, you would have more prominent dedicated lanes. Um, in some cases, they might be you know, kind of a barrier or something like that. But here you see renderings of concepts for center running dedicated lanes along a median. And the lower rendering shows how you would have a station at the intersection where there would be a stop for boarding on both directions on that center running uh, corridor. Also, pay before you board stations. So just like at the rail station where you're going through the turnstile and you're paying, so you're just, there's no kind of queuing as people are entering the bus and waiting for everybody to touch their card, dip their card, and get on and, and increase dwell times, the concept is having a bus stop like a rail station where everyone's already paid, they're ready to get on, you have more doors on the bus to speed boarding once the bus does arrive, and so it just really reduces those dwell times and overall increases the speed of service. <laughs> Signal prioritization. Modernized traffic signals that have an application in them that speaks to technology on the bus so that the bus can say, okay, traffic signal, I'm almost there, hold that green for me, or I've been sitting here, turn the red green a little faster so that we can keep moving and we can keep on schedule. How many times have you been sort of just get on the bus and then it just turns red, they've got to wait for the whole cycle. The idea is recognizing that the number of people you have on the bus and the volume of people that buses are moving through that corridor should be given some prioritization in terms of being able to get through those green lights and uh, through the, the traffic intersections more quickly and reliably. Also, at grade boarding, I mentioned about trying to speed up dwell times when people are boarding um, and alighting the bus. Uh, right now, our bus is kneel to get to a lower spot for people in um, that are disabled or in, um, in need of a lower boarding level, this would just make an even boarding level. So you see the station designs all are raised above the normal curb level. So where are we? Some of you may be familiar with what we've been doing on the south side um, with the Jeffrey Boulevard bus rapid transit sort of pilot. We are piloting many elements of BRT in that corridor. The Jeffrey Express number 14 has been rebranded as the J14 Jeffrey Jump. If you haven't taken a ride on it, I hope you do. It's traveling all the way from 103rd to Stony up into the loop, um, so through South Shore, almost to Hyde Park, uh, onto the Lakeshore Drive, and then around the loop. It's a major commuter uh, bus line, and we have made investments to transform that bus route into a faster, more reliable service in which we are incorporating some but not all of the BRT elements that uh, we've talked about and that you see expressed around the world. So we've got rush hour bus lanes. It's not 24-7 dedicated. We've got unique branding on the buses and major um, different types of amenities at the stations. Uh, you'll see some images of the street furniture. And then uh, real-time information 
on the buses themselves about real-time arrival time. When am I going to get to my destination? No more of that wondering how long or is it expected to take me to get to my destination. We launched the service in November. Some of those technology improvements are still in the implementation stage. Um, and the, the onboard bus information will be added and the transit signal prioritization will all be done um, later this spring and into the summer. So we've been getting a lot of positive feedback about that and we do hope to give it a try. Sort of thinking of this in a tier, you've got Jeffrey, which has already been implemented, is piloting some of these ideas. When are we going to see the next level of implementation in terms of scale and uh, quality of improvements and complexity of improvements? Central Loop BRT is uh, in the design stages. It's starting final design and um, is going to be going into construction in 2014. Gabe Klein will talk more about the specifics of this project, but we are really excited about this. It will be a BRT corridor going across the loop, essentially bookended by uh, Union Station and Navy Pier. But there are going to be six different bus lines that are benefited from this corridor. And, um, and so it's not just about one bus line. You know, some people are thinking, oh, you're just going to Navy Pier, it's just for tourists. No, this is about moving all commuters that are currently in buses going across the loop, as well as north-south around Union Station, um, really cleaning up and organizing the roadway there. So we have defined spaces for here's the bus, here's where the travel lanes are going to be for vehicles, here's the bicyclists, to really reduce congestion and move traffic through the loop. Right now we've got buses that are going slower than pedestrians, so something's wrong there and how do we fix that and really um, make everyone's travel times faster. Western and Ashland. Uh, we've been in the news in the last year about Western and Ashland. We've been doing a federally funded study to uh, look at the possibilities for implementation of BRT on both of these corridors. 30,000 people travel on the bus already, the local bus on each of these corridors. 30,000 on Western, 30,000 on Ash, and about on a given weekday. Tremendous number of people moving through that. So we have a real interest in making that a more efficient, speedier, reliable service. And also, um, it has major connections all over the city. Warren Ribley's here from IMD to talk more about this project in particular, but connectivity is a big portion, a big reason behind why we're looking seriously at BRT on these corridors in particular. You have major connections to jobs, schools, entertainment. You have the IMD, UIC, the Malcolm X facility, uh, United Center. There's 187,000 jobs in this study area. So this can really be transformative. Those are just sort of the jobs economic connections, but think about the other transportation connectivity. We don't have a major north-south rail line uh, on our CTA system. This would connect with eight other CTA rail lines, these two quarters, six metro lines, 64 CTA bus routes, as well as a bike network. So when we have this hub and spoke fixed rail system and people are having to go all the way downtown to then go all the way back out, if, even if they want to stay on the west side, how do we support better connectivity and make overall transportation more efficient and get people to work and play and school and where they really need to be. So just a few more stats. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Ashland and Western have huge ridership. They are second and third uh, most used bus routes currently. Uh, 79th and Chicago are the other in the top four if you're keeping track. Um, in these corridors, similar to some of the stats I think Gabe will share about the loop, you've got 1% of the vehicles on the road with the buses, but they're carrying 14% of the people. Uh, so, and, and that's for Ashland and for Western, it's 1% and 18% of the people. So how do we better balance out essentially who's moving through that corridor to, to balance that out and give the appropriate priority and thinking from a complete streets perspective, both from design as well as a functioning of the city. And then a little bit of stats again, getting back to what does it mean to increase speed? The modeling that we've been doing shows that you could increase travel times on the bus by up to 80% compared to today. Uh, that's huge. That gets you close to what it's like to be on rail. So that bottom part of the chart here is comparing a trip between Fullerton and 79th. On the red line, that takes 33 minutes on average. If you did a full-scale BRT on Western, you could do that in 40 minutes. That's an incredible opportunity for us uh, without having to put in a whole fixed guideway elevated system there um, and 
even better, you have a bus system, a BRT system that is connected to the streetscape, that is connected to direct economic development there, and has a lot of positive community impacts. And then there's a little stat here about what that trans, what the service improvements and the speed improvements translate into in terms of um, travel time for people, and how that translates really into dollars for people's pockets, because time is money, and how that translates into promoting economic development for a region. Um, the last is just an overview, what to look for kind of coming in 2013 with BRT citywide. Uh, mentioned we've been in the planning phases for Ashland and Western over the past year. That process is continuing. The Department of Housing and Economic Development is also going to be undertaking some land use planning and looking at those opportunities. Just as I mentioned, you're going to have this you know, opportunity to really impact the streetscape and the built environment and how does that interact and support economic development and community development more generally. Someone mentioned already the Chicago Architecture Foundation is will be launching a station design competition that we're very excited about to gather even more interest and creative ideas about how to make these new stations a positive impact. Uh, Gabe will speak a little bit more to Central Loop BRT and the design and construction schedule. And then also CDOT is launching an overall study for this whole city in terms of a larger network plan. How do these three projects that we've already got in the mix, Jeffrey, Central Loop, and then the Western Ashland corridors generally, how do those relate to a larger scheme and vision for what BRT could be in Chicago? So with that, um, there'll be a test afterwards. I hope you all took notes. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, and I'll pass it on to Gabe. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just checking to see if it's afternoon. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually know what time it was. Just to echo what Peter said, this is an amazing partnership between so many different types of organizations. And I think um, it's the key to our being really successful uh, with this program. Um, I'm going to talk about the Central Loop BRT and Union Station Transit Center, which are coming right up uh, and we're working on aggressively uh, in partnership with CTA. But first, let's talk a little bit about the history. So before I was even born, uh, it was recognized that there was an issue. And the picture in the bottom left shows you that in the Chicago Central Area Transit Planning Study in 1968, there was a recognition that we needed to have some sort of cross-town subway. Well, that didn't happen. It was very expensive, even back then. And then uh, there was another project which I really like, actually, the circulator light rail. Came close to happening. Again, it was hard to put the money together. Didn't happen. Um, and so I think as a result, there's a little bit of planning fatigue, probably, particularly for people that have lived through this. So the good news is, we're doing this. Uh, <laughs> this is funded, and it's happening. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, but why is it happening? Well. Obviously, there's a benefit to downtown. And one thing that's interesting to note is that, um, yes, we lost 200,000 residents in Chicago from 2000 to 2010. However, if you look two miles from City Hall, we actually gained 50,000 residents. So we're turning into a smart growth urban core, live, work, play, more and more. And we're adding about 5,000 people a year in, in the downtown. So basically, you have a downtown that's expanding. I live in the South Loop. A lot of people live in the West Loop. And it's all starting to merge. Now, with BRT, we think we can get a lot of the benefits that were projected with the Crosstown Subway and Circulator Light Rail, but at much less cost. Uh, and obviously, it's a more versatile service because it's not fixed guideway. So the Central Area Plan, I was born when this came out. Uh, <laughs> 2003, uh, Luann Hamilton, who's not with us today, worked extensively on that, and I'm sure m many others. It was updated in 2009, and they started to look at transitways for connectivity, Carroll Ave, Clinton Corridor, and the Monroe Busway. Also, uh, as a result, we were able to apply and get this Central Loop BRT grant, which is a $25 million urban circulator grant from FTA to fulfill the first part of this plan when it comes to, to transit connectivity. So really, the Monroe Busway is what we'll be building 
although it'll be on Washington and Madison. Well, because once you get into the planning, <laughs> once you actually design it, you realize that uh, maybe there are other streets that work better. Uh, so anyway, civic benefits. Well, really, who doesn't benefit from this? I mean, everybody benefits, whether you're a landowner, uh, whether you're an employer, uh, whether you're an employee that recently moved downtown, or whether you live anywhere else in the city. You know, I had somebody tell me uh, maybe six months ago that he takes the Jeffrey bus before it was the Jeffrey Jump, and he was very excited about the Jeffrey Jump. But he said, it takes me 20 minutes from my house to get downtown. I think he was at like 83rd. But then it takes me, he might have been exaggerating a little, but he said it takes me another 20 minutes to get through the loop. And so um, this is going to affect anybody who takes one of those six lines that comes through, as well as the new rebranded bus rapid transit route. Uh, and then the Union Station Transit Center, which I'll talk about in a bit, will affect five or six other buses as well and, and help them as well. I love this slide. Um, when we looked at, at uh, uh, Washington and Madison, first of all, we realized 56% of people on these corridors are walking. Many of them are walking from Union Station, or they're just walking from any of the CTA stations that are in the loop. <laughs> and then when we dug into it, I don't think I have a little red thingy here, but... Um, uh, yeah, I should be the book. Oh. Oh, great. Okay. Whoops. Okay. So when you look over here, 4% of the traffic in the loop is buses. So a pretty small amount versus like 28% for taxis. But when you look at the people, and more and more in cities, we're trying to look at throughput of people versus vehicles and, and such. And you see that 47% uh, of the people are in these few buses that are going through the loop. Yet we don't give them a lot of priority. 2% um, are on bikes. That's going to grow dramatically, but that's a whole other presentation. But it, it is interesting to note that 28% are taxis, but only 14% are in taxis. But they get 28% of the right of way on average. Um, something else I'd like to note is that people, ooh, maybe this lady who fatally stabbed her cat is not excited. <laughs> I just noticed that, wow. Chris must have forgot to crop that. And there's new nonstop flights. But anyway, um, people are really excited. Let's cover that lady up. <laughs> people are really excited about BRT coming to the loop, coming downtown. And if you look, we have another presentation. If you look at, uh, uh, there's a picture online from 1939. Washington used to have a bus lane, actually, right down the middle. It used to have a platform right down the middle as well. So what's old is new. Oh, and there's more. But the public is bought in. In fact, I don't think I've gotten one negative email, one negative phone call, or anybody even coming up to me and talking to me and saying that they weren't excited about this. So let's talk about what it is. Um, Re Rebecca gave actually a great overview. Pretty much she told the whole story. But I'll try to go into a little bit more, more detail. Um, we chose Alternative 2. And many of you uh, saw Alternative 1, which was sort of BRT light. Alternative three, which was a little extreme in that we only had one uh, uh, lane through for cars. This is really a balanced, complete street approach to BRT. Um, we're going to have a dedicated enforced lane. You get a protected bike lane, which is important, and a platform uh, out in the street. And this is a representation of what a station may look like. We're figuring that out. But we really want it to be a grand station. Um, uh, what else? Uh, at um, grade boarding and off board fare collection, it's going to serve 30 route. I mean, six routes, uh, a bus every two minutes. So there's a lot of buses coming through there. Um, and uh, there'll be another protected bike lane on Randolph as well, by the way. And then on Clinton, we'll have a two way lane, like the Dearborn facility, which is right out here. So what's our schedule? Um, we just announced, I think last week it was in the paper, the formal selection of Alternative 2. Uh, we will complete our final design uh, by the end of this year. And then we go to construction first thing next year um, and finish it by the end of 2014, which is very exciting. So we're 
on track, basically, to get this thing done uh, next year. So um, let's talk about where it connects. It's going to connect to Navy Pier on one end, but on the other, Union Station, which is a crucial part of our transportation infrastructure and connectivity. Uh, we've got at Union Station, I think, 120,000 people a day coming in on Metra and Amtrak. It's about 114,000 on Metra, uh, 10, 12,000 on Amtrak. It's the third busiest Amtrak station in the United States. Uh, so it's very, very, very busy. And um, when we looked at this, we realized it's going to grow more. And you can see, you know, it needs some help. Um, and people are falling over each other on the platform. So. Uh, the master plan looked a lot at short and medium term, term what we needed to do. We want to make it more inviting, uh, in, enlarge these platforms, but we also want to make it more of a true multimodal center, as has happened in Washington, D.C., with that Union Station. And one of the things that happened in Washington is they took one of the parking platforms and they actually made it a bus terminal. And I was lucky enough to be able to uh, help make that happen. So. Um, what you're going to see here is much of the same. Um, we're taking the block uh, just south of Union Station, which is currently a parking deck, and, and well, not really a deck, an out, outdoor surface lot, and we're going to uh, convert it into a bus transit center, which will primarily benefit CTA and obviously all the people that use it. Um, it'll be integrated with the BRT plans. In fact, the, the mayor calls it the, the BRT transit center. Um, it's going to have uh, three lanes and nine bays serving five routes. It'll have its own traffic signal, sheltered uh, uh, boarding areas with screens so people can tell when the bus is coming. And this is very important. It's going to have an underground uh, link to Union Station. So when it's cold, as it is much of the year here, I can tell you firsthand, um, you'll be uh, covered, which is very important. And then, of course, Ventra Fair uh, uh, vending machines. And I should mention that we're going to work closely with CTA to figure out what the off-board fare collection will look like uh, on BRT. And Ventra is probably going to play a big role in that as it rolls out. Uh, here's a diagram of what it looks like. The green lines there, you can see how, how PEDS will flow. Uh, blue lines, CTA bus flows. Um, you can see the new PED connection and the existing PEDway. Uh, that's there currently. And I just want to note also, so yes, there's some parking going away, but there's a huge garage with a lot of capacity right here next door. And to be honest, we have a lot of capacity for parking throughout the loop. Here's some more renderings as to what it will look like. We just got these uh, in the last week or so. So we're at 30% design now, and we're also working on the acquisition of the land right now. Um, so you can get a sense of what it's going to look like. We haven't added the public art yet, so it's a little gray right now, but it'll be beautiful, I promise. And with that, I'll turn it over to Warren. Thank you. As Warren's coming up to the podium, I just want to give him a brief introduction. Uh, Warren's last position was running the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity for the state of Illinois. Come on up. And, uh, you know, there they were looking at, at a wide range of community development issues, transportation and housing and, and connecting and all these issues coming together around community development. Well, now at the IMD, I would suggest that one of his interests in BRT is, is, is very similar. It's about how BRT can really connect residents to that workforce, bring patients to the hospital. Um, he's got some tremendous stats about the impact of IMD, so I'm not going to steal any of his thunder, but the numbers are pretty astounding. Warren. Thank you very much, um, Peter, and it's a real pleasure to be here today, and I want to thank uh, MPC for inviting me. And I'm going to really going to be talking about the impact of BRT from an employer perspective, um, an employee or worker perspective, um, a, a client perspective. And in our case, the clients are typically um, healthcare patients and students, uh, and then also the economic development um, impact. So I'm going to fast forward to this slide first, just to kind of establish uh, the framework for you that um, uh, some of you may not be as familiar with the, uh, the medical district. 
Um, it is um, 560 acres altogether, and you'll note um, shortly of what our great interest is because if our eastern uh, boundary uh, actually is um, Ashland, and I want to try to figure out the... Um, Ashley, on, Ashland on the, on the east, um, Congress Parkway is our northern boundary. Um, actually, Oakley is our western boundary, but this would be western right here. So when we're talking about the Ashland western corridor, you, you can immediately see uh, the potential impact for uh, the medical district. And then we go all the way south to the intermodal facility. Um, this slide uh, gives you maybe a little bit better uh, visual. Um, it runs actually from uh, 1600 west to 2300 west, uh, 500 south down to 1500 south. So it, it's a big, uh, big campus. Uh, this is, sorry, uh, primarily the medical campus uh, relates all in this uh, quadrant here. So you have the Rush campus, you have the Cook County campus, all of the Brown is UIC's campus, and then uh, the Jesse Brown VA campus. Uh, we also obviously have the blue line to the north. We have the pink line that runs through here. This part of the district is known as the Chicago Technology Park. Uh, along Roosevelt Road, you have a number of uh, social service entities. You have the FBI headquarters here, the uh, Cook County Juvenile uh, Detention Headquarters. So, uh, a lot of different uses, and as you, as you can imagine from uh, those, those major affiliate organizations, a, a great number of, of client services that are being performed, many of which uh, come to the district by uh, public transportation. Um, and these are some of the statistics that, that Peter was uh, going to talk to you about, or I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, keep in mind, uh, we are essentially, though, uh, a commuter community. Uh, it is a vibrant 24-7, 365 community with the four hospitals, the two major um, medical universities, 8,000 students. Uh, this statistic actually is, um, is dated. Uh, in fact, I would suggest to you that number today is probably closer to 30 to 35,000. Uh, we're in the process of getting all these numbers updated through the UIC's College of Urban Planning. Uh, the, the, set, the number of visitors is a pretty staggering figure. But again, it, it's a commuter campus. These are employees and employees that are coming in to work and they are leaving. Uh, and it, these are patients that are coming in for patient care and leaving. So. One of the things that all of the hospitals talk to us about uh, is a, a lack of parking. Uh, it, they all have parking decks. They're all full. Uh, if you drive along Harrison Congress on any given day, uh, you can't find a, a parking spot. Uh, public transportation is critical to the growth of the medical district. And I'm here to tell you, there is going to be growth in the medical district. If we go back and look at the, uh, this map, you can notice this is all land to be developed. And you know what it is today? It's service parking. Next year, that land will be developed, and it's not going to be surface parking. So that is going to put additional pressures. This land right down here at the corner of Roosevelt and Ogden, by the way, this is all Ogden running through here, is going to be developed. It's vacant now. All of these parcels here are vacant. They're going to see development in the next couple of years. That's what I was hired to do. That's why the governor, the mayor, the Cook County president just appointed a new commission in, in April of last year to bring development to this area, development that supports and builds upon the health care, uh, the, the, the the excellence of health care we have, but to build upon that to make the medical district in Illinois a recognized world-class center for patient care and medical research. So we're going to have to pay attention to how we can get uh, people uh, in to the district and back out. We can't just do it with building more parking. In fact, we shouldn't do it that way. 
And that is why uh, proposals like uh, uh, BRS is, BRT is so important to us. That's why what we see the city doing with uh, the bike share program uh, is so important to us. Look at the economic impact that is already being generated. It's 3.3 billion. Uh, and again, these are dated numbers. I'm, I'm sure that it's actually uh, much higher than that uh, uh, today. I'm a consumer of the bus services. I generally every single day either walk or, or take the Harrison Street uh, bus. Uh, I formerly would take the, uh, the Roosevelt bus. And I can tell you, when you stop at Taylor and Roosevelt, the bus nearly clears out. And it's people that are going to the uh, Jesse Brown VA Hospital for service. When you stop at the Harrison and Ogden uh, bus stop, the bus nearly empties out. It's people that are going to Cook County Hospital for treatment. If you stop at uh, uh, the stop at Harrison and um, um, along, or along Polk Street, you see a lot of UIC students getting out. So we have to be able to provide better access and quicker access because we're going to be bringing a lot more people into the medical district. This is our mission. Um, and as we become a leader in patient care and medical research, again, we're going to be bringing many more people in. You know, we only have a certain defined geographic uh, boundaries, and the density is going to increase. So to be able to handle that density, we have to look to alternative means. It also means, and I'm glad to hear some of the plans for improving uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the L. We need better access for patients coming off the blue line, off the pink line. So it all ties together. But that's why this is such an important uh, proposal uh, for us. Um, really interesting statistic that kind of brings us home. If you look, th these are the statistics for people that are coming into the district um, by bus. 8% of them are coming uh, on a work-related trip. 12% are coming for a non-work-related trip, and about 10% total. The thing that makes that interesting, if you look at the region, the entire uh, region, people that come in for work trips generally is like at 13%. People that are coming in for non-work is like at 6%, and the overall usage is about 8%. So what that tells you is there is density already within the medical district. But the real important thing is the major use that's coming in that is different from most other areas. It's, it's people that are coming in for healthcare purposes. It's patients or it's students that are coming into the universities. Those are our clients. And then without building, having better facilities to serve better clients, more clients, and having better ways of getting them to the district, it's going to impede our ability to achieve our goal to become a leader in patient care and medical research. So we've seen the statistics on uh, Roosevelt and Ashland, but look at some of those others. Um, Western, or I'm sorry, Western, we, Roosevelt we talked about, um, Harrison we talked about. I'm very pleased that the Streeterville uh, Taylor uh, route is one of the routes that's covered under the, uh, the central area plan because that's a very important route for us because it also connects up to Northwestern's hospital and it also connects down to Sinai, but then it comes through the medical district as well. Uh, important statistic to note that I think makes uh, this an important route is about a lot of the uh, affiliate physicians that uh, are attending physicians at uh, uh, Jesse Brown VA Hospital and at uh, Stroger Cook County Hospital have affiliation with Northwestern. So there's a lot of professionals that uh, are coming into the district um, that can make access to that uh, through that route and to have the, the quicker uh, times to get in and out will make it uh, much more attractive to, to use. Another interesting thing is, as you can see, we've got the uh, uh, increases uh, noted on, of the uh, usage, um, already continuing to see additional increase 
and with having uh, the bus uh, rapid transit, it would certainly help build those numbers. From a selfish perspective, and I know the analysis is being done, we'd love to see it uh, on Ashland, obviously with Ashland being our, uh, our eastern boundary, and that's really where the access to all the medical facilities are at. Western's important, without a doubt, uh, but, but I think to achieve our goals, we'd really love to see uh, the Ash Ashland route uh, uh, considered. We've been a, an early and, and consistent uh, supporter of, uh, of the proposal. This is a, just a, a letter uh, that I had penned uh, that, that uh, I think was from October of last year. Uh, we'll continue to be a supporter. We think it's critically important for the economic growth of the medical district for it to help us achieve what we have, which is a very aggressive mission, but more importantly, to provide better access to the patients that are going to be coming in, which that's expanding every day. It's a, it's a, a very exciting time in the healthcare industry under the Affordable Care Act. You probably have heard about Cook County Hospital's goals to uh, enroll 100,000 uh, new patients under Medicaid. They have to do that for their economic survival, and those patients are going to need access to the facilities and largely that's gonna to have to be served through public transportation. So I hope that puts a little bit of a human face on it and really shows you the potential impact it has on our overall economy for the city and the region and to make the medical district a world-class facility. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> so MPC has been working on the issue of bus rapid transit, as I mentioned, for some number of years. Uh, in 2011, we published a report. There are still a few copies of this available uh, on the back tables. Please grab one if you're interested. Laying out the, the vision at that time for where BRT might be possible um, and, uh, and actually identifying Western and Ashland as some prime candidates. So pleased to see those moving forward. That work, of course, wouldn't be possible without the support of a lot of our funders, um, some of whom are in the room today. I know we've got representatives from the Boeing Foundation in the room, um, Grand Victoria Foundation. Uh, I think Globetrotters is here as well, private firm that has been supporting our work in BRT. Uh, but also, we've been supported by the Rockefeller Foundation in this effort as well. Nick's going to talk about um, some of their work nationally and globally around the issue of BRT um, and what they're working on in that regard. Thanks, Nick. There I am. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Nick Turner. I'm a managing director from the Rockefeller Foundation. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, why uh, the work that is happening in Chicago on bus rapid transit is so important, uh, why it's important nationally, why we took a real interest in the ambitions that existed here. Um, but before I do so, what I'd like to do is just sort of give you a very quick background on you know, why the Rockefeller Foundation even cares about uh, transportation. Um, back in 2008, we launched a 75 million seven-year initiative that was focused on trying to advance uh, equitable and sustainable transportation. And what we really meant by that is that we wanted to uh, uh, help to catalyze a shift in this country so that we would uh, develop transportation system in this country and a paradigm thinking about transportation and mobility that uh, strengthened cities, uh, that reduced the economic burden that the current transportation system imposes on millions of Americans and that uh, reduces uh, pollution. Um, one of the sort of critical cases for uh, trying, to, to, trying to get that to happen and trying to reduce this economic burgeon, burden is the recognition that um, access to uh, affordable and a uh, readily available public transportation is quite difficult for most Americans. I think the statistic is that half of all Americans have no access to public transportation, which means that uh, in order to get to job, school, home, you have to have a car. I mean, you must have it. It is, it is a requirement. That imposes a cost of $8,000 uh, on, on households uh, to own one car if you're uh, two 
uh, worker household, you might have to own two, that's $16,000. So transportation is the second highest household cost for Americans. And when you look at metropolitan regions, um, for low income workers, it's the highest household cost. So this is a statistic that uh, the Brookings Institution, uh, uh, Institute uncovered, which is that one quarter of all jobs in low and middle skill industries are accessible via transit in metro regions in the United States uh, by less than 90 minutes. So that, is, that just gives you an indication of what a huge uh, tax on people's time it is to get where they need to go. So this is something that we wanted to uh, work on to hopefully try to change uh, in the 21st century. Much of our focus had been on federal policy and state policy uh, as well. But we knew how important it was for uh, federal policymakers to see innovation and, ex and, um, and uh, you know, new ideas bubbling up from from important cities around the country. And so that's why we started to get interested in the work here in Chicago. Um, I want to also talk about one critical uh, factor that, that has become more and more clear over recent years, um, but it wasn't so clear uh, six or seven years ago, which is that there's a remarkable generational shift in terms of people's demand for transportation and for mobility. So the story is, is that, as you see from this, uh, from this um, uh, story from Ad Week, and you've probably seen it in many other places, is that young people are driving a lot less. Uh, we looked at millennials, uh, 18 to 34 year olds, and between uh, 2000 and 2009, the vehicle miles traveled by that population dropped 23%. Um, there are a lot of other statistics that bear out this change uh, in mobility habits and a change of desires in terms of how people want to get around and where they want to live. And they want to live in places like Chicago uh, in dense, livable, uh, robust uh, environments, just like Gabe talked about. But that's a critical thing for uh, policymakers to get their heads around. And I would say that in Washington, that isn't the case. And so when places like Chicago start to recognize this market shift, as well as the need of low-income workers and start to improve transit and, and options, uh, that's the kind of thing that we think uh, policymakers will take notice of. Um, this is just sort of a fun chart I wanted to show you that gives some indication of the, of the changes in travel habits. It is not a model at all. It is merely an extrapolation of some trends. So if you look at, the, um, at this blue line, this just shows the trend, the growth in vehicle miles traveled from 1987 until about 2004. So pretty you know, predictable traje trajectory upward. And then uh, from 2004, so this is before the recession and the financial crisis, you know, a real drop. Now, most models, as at least I understand them, uh, pretty much presume that this line would sort of go on in perpetuity and that a lot of the transportation planning would really, um, would really assimilate that basic, uh, that basic trend in vehicle miles traveled. So if one were to assume that, then you would think that from 2013 onward, this is what we'd see. Now, if you look at, if you look at, I'm just, I'm not going to point out all of these, but if you consider the youth trend that I just told you about, this 23% drop in vehicle miles traveled from 2009 to 2010, and we're to extrapolate on that and said if we were to all follow what they did, this is what vehicle miles traveled would do going forward. So it's just an indication of the shift that we're seeing in the need for cities like Chicago and others mm -hmm. to really get their heads around how to expand accessible, affordable, uh, desired public transportation. So, okay, so why bus rapid transit? So, uh, you know, we, today I guess is the first day of this sequestration. So we all know that we are living in times of increased transit demand, increased tr uh, demand for the amenities of the city, uh, but not a lot of money, and a lot of frustration uh, around the, de the time it takes for projects to be developed, to go from, uh, you know, conception to actually being operable. And bus rapid transit, we observed from uh, our little perch on Fifth Avenue at Rockefeller, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, was uh, one mode, a technology that wasn't really well utilized in the United States, but if you looked in places like Bogota or Mexico City or Istanbul or Jakarta, they had very high performing bus rapid transit systems that provided reliable, fast, dependable transit got cars off the road, reduced, uh, and reduced pollution. 
Um, but the story in the United States is that no one has really managed to do it that well. And so there's an opportunity to expand bus rapid transit in the US, but uh, many of the projects that we've seen around the country are what uh, people call derisively BRT light, uh, or use the term uh, people branded as bus rapid transit, but it really isn't in fact because it only utilizes certain characteristics of bus rapid transit. So we thought, wouldn't it be great if there were a few cities that could, could uh, move forward and advance projects of the kind that one sees in Bogota or Mexico City? And one of the ways that we thought this would be possible was to establish a, uh, a, a standard system. So you know, across the street, I think there's a silver lead building. And this is the same basic concept, which is to try to um, tighten up the definition of what bus rapid transit is and define the characteristics that, that lead to uh, dependable and reliable and fast, predictable service and uh, establish a gold, silver, and bronze uh, 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 standard setting system. And the Institute for Transportation uh, and Development Policies was our, poli was our partner that worked on that. Um, as you will see, there are no cities in the United States that have uh, gold or silver. Um, right now, uh, the only uh, corridors that exist in the US that really approach um, anything of the high quality that we see globally are the ones that you see up along, I'm sorry, up along the top here. And so therein lies the opportunity for Chicago, which is to lead the way in the United States. We hear a lot about Chicago being a global city um, and, and to really show other cities what can be done with this particular technology of transportation. And that matters because we know how things work in the United States. It is not always federal policy that drives things, but it is innovations that happen in cities that other mayors then pick up the newspaper and they say, huh, I want that. Uh, and they say, you know, Gabe's counterpart or Rebecca's counterpart in LA or San Francisco get an article with something circled on it and says, like, <laughs> that's what I want. And so what we want is we want Chicago to be able to be that for the rest of the country. So this is just a quick note on why we need a standard. And I'm going to pick on uh, New York, because uh, it's always fun to pick on New York, even if you're, uh, if, you're a if you're a citizen of it and you're here in Chicago. So this is really a, you know, this is, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm being, a, uh, you know, uh, a little bit, um, I'm catering to my crowd. But here's New York's select bus service, which is not bus rapid transit, according to the standard. It does not even rate bronze. And you see that we have uh, painted lanes to designate for the buses, and you see that everyone parks in them. Um, uh, and then you see here rapid ride in Seattle, which is also branded as bus rapid transit, but it's sitting in mixed traffic, so it's going at the same pace as the rest of, uh, as the, rest of the cars. Um, I wanted to talk very quickly just about Cleveland's health line. I'm not going to go into detail about it, but there are a few themes that came out in the presentations today. Cleveland's health line is probably the best example of American bus rapid transit. It runs down Euclid Avenue from downtown Cleveland to the, to the area where the Cleveland Clinic and Case Western and a number of other hospitals are. Um, there you see some of the distinctive stations that um, I am sure after the, the Chicago Architecture Foundation um, uh, competition is completed, the Chicago stations will be even more distinctive than this, but this is at least Cleveland's version of them. Um, but there was conversation here about, uh, Peter mentioned the interest in placemaking, and uh, Warren talked about, you know, the economic uh, development potential of, of transit and how those things are so tightly linked. This is an article that came out in Cleveland in 2008. You can see that uh, the presidential picks were McCain and Obama, so you know this is a little bit dated, but note, this, note the headline that 4.3 billion in new investment in the city already along that corridor where the health line was, uh, was established. Um, this next slide is just, uh, is, is just an example from the international context. Uh, this shows the uh, percentage value increase in real estate along the Transmilenio um, corridors. Uh, this is by year, but you can see that you know, once the corridor was put, put in place in 2001, 
at least at its height, the real estate uh, within walking distance was valued at 20% more than outside of that radius. So uh, there, there, this is uh, Transmillennial, I'm sorry, is in Bogota, Colombia. So, uh, so just an indication that there is, there's evidence to support uh, much of what both Peter and Warren and others talked about. Um, and then I'm just going to leave you with this. Uh, you know, I was struck that Warren was going to be on this presentation today, um, on this panel. And one of the things that we've known, noticed in New York over the past decades is that our, is that our uh, employment centers um, are growing rapidly. And they're not all in the CBD. They are in the outer boroughs. So JFK Airport, 55,000 employees. The Central Brooklyn Medical Center, 20,000 employees. Um, and then there are other, all of these colored blobs are examples of, of uh, high growth employment centers. One of the problems with our transit system is that it's very much a, ra it's a radial system. So if you want to get to Manhattan and you need nine different ways to do it, um, our subway system does that very effectively. Almost every line that we have runs through Manhattan, which means that if you live in the Bronx, and you need to work uh, at JFK, you will take a line that goes all the way down here and then out, out, and then to JFK. And that's an hour and a half ride. Or if you live in Queens and, you wanna work at, and you're working at JFK, you can either hop in your car um, or you can take a train that brings you through Manhattan, brings you back around this way. It, it's, I don't mean to denigrate the system, but it was constructed the way uh, people thought the city would grow, um, and that has turned out to change. So what New York doesn't have is a system that really uh, services well the people who are working in these places where it wasn't previously anticipated. So this is just an example of some of the thinking that's going on right now in New York about how uh, a bus rapid transit system might be able to uh, better connect borough to borough, might be able to better connect some of the transit lines in the same way that the Ashland or Western BRT establishes the kind of connections that Rebecca talked about. So this right now, so this is an existing bus rapid transit line, well, uh, select bus service, so not quite bus rapid transit, as is this dark blue one. But there's a lot of thought about ways to sort of to create connections. These are not plans yet. There are no corridors. They're just thinking about these are where areas where we might want to have better uh, connections. And you see them here. So I only wanted to leave you with that to say that these are things that people are starting to think about in New York and in other places. We are not caught up to where Chicago is by any means. But we hope to be following you in the near future. Thanks very much. Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> so there are, there are things we can learn from New York. We're not completely uh, closed-minded here in Chicago. In fact, one of the things we, we learned from New York, and we can thank the Rockefeller Foundation for that as well, uh, is Streets Blog. So quick show of hands, who subscribes to Streets Blog? Next time you come to MPC, 100% of your hands have to go up. Streets Blog Chicago uh, is a terrific online news service, uh, which is here in Chicago now. We have an outlet. Uh, with some seed funding thanks to the Rockefeller Foundation and the Chicago Community Trust. Um, subscribe to it and they get you a, a daily news feed. They cover these kinds of issues like BRT, like uh, pedestrian and bike issues. So if you care about these things, uh, you will find no better coverage in Chicago. Um, next, if this, oh, there we go. Next, we're going to move to your turn. Um, so I'm going to ask everybody to uh, raise your hand. We've got a couple folks wandering around with microphones. Um, and to please wait for the microphone because we are, as I failed to mention at the, at the beginning, uh, not only being webcast, but being recorded for Chicago Amplified as well. Um, so this will be available for download and podcasting and listening to at your leisurely pleasure later. Um, so we have a question in the front row, um, which Kyle, come on up. Kyle's going to bring a microphone to Alan. Please just introduce yourself and, uh, and, and state your question. Uh, Alan Mellis. Um, I know I was a member of the Brown Line Task Force and president of the Friends of Fuller and Allen. I won't go any longer. I had two quick questions, one for Rebecca, uh, about fare integration. And so if you go from, someone comes from the suburbs and goes to a union station, I know it'll be venture, I know it'll be the same system maybe, but will it be like a transfer? And what I'm concerned about is we'll build this great system and the cost, the added cost of a metro ticket 
to the bus rapid transit would have people not use it. So my question is, are you looking to make it more like a transfer? So if I'm on a metro train, I come and use BRT, that the fare would be different than if I just got on the BRT. And the second question is for Warren. Obviously, you like to see it on Ashland. You made that very clear. Um, would you look after BRT went in to have an internal circulator within your medical district to take people from that station at Ashland through your campus? Because it does appear that it's obviously on one side of the district. So sorry for the double question. Thank you, Alan. I, I sort of break the answer into two pieces. One is that the BRT service that we're rolling out is intended to be fully integrated with CTA's fair payment system. So in terms of, you know, will BRT be on its own unique fare system? No, that'll be part of what CTA is doing. PACE has joined in with CTA on that new fare system, which you uh, thankfully <laughs> introduced at Ventra. I hope all of you have heard of it already and look out for more to come in the coming months. Uh, Metra is not yet participating in the Ventra system, but we are coordinating with them closely. They have a lot of their own business decisions to make about the next generation of fare payment for their system. But ultimately, the goal for the region is to have one universal um, method of payment. And in fact, uh, a lot of the modernization aspects of the Ventra fare system will interface well with those riders that are already using credit cards, let's say, to buy monthly passes on Metra, et cetera. Yeah, I understand integration. My question was the fare. W will the fare be basically a you know, Metra fare, and then you come and you pay a full uh, BRT fare? So the BRT, so for Jeffrey, it's the fare is the same as a regular bus route, and our expectation is similar for Central Loop. Um, we have certain interagency fare products with Metra that allow for um, a monthly Metra Pass holder to have also access in the AM PM rush. But in terms of a per ride transfer, let's say from Metra to BRT or any CTA local bus, that's a that's a separate question that's not answered at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, right now, uh, both uh, UIC and um, for sure Cook County Hospital and I think even Rush operate their own uh, transfer systems, bus transfer systems. Uh, I think those are primarily designed for either the student population or in the case of Rush and, and Cook County Hospital for their employees. Um, but. Looking at this on a longer term vision, yes, I think we are going to have to look at uh, more of an intra district uh, transportation uh, solution. Uh, obviously, we'll work closely with uh, uh, CDOT and CTA on that, but there may have to be uh, an intra district um, uh, solution. We know that as the expansion continues, uh, obviously, there's going to always be a lot of uh, vehicular. Uh, transportation on the main corridors um, uh, like the Ogden and, and Roosevelt, but our goal is to uh, decrease uh, vehicular traffic uh, throughout the district, make it much more of a positive community campus-like feel. Uh, and But given the, the size of the district, you have to be able to move people around. So uh, I think we very well um, will be uh, forced and certainly would be prudent to look uh, toward that uh, uh, that type of a solution. Thank you. Thanks, Warren. I also want to make sure the audience is aware that Chris Zeman is in the room. Chris, stand up so folks can see you. Chris is the BRT Chicago coordinator. So that large steering committee I mentioned in the introductions, Chris is responsible for herding all those people together. There's another question over here while we're getting to it. Um, Chris is also, some of his work in 2013, will be putting together a system plan for Chicago for the remaining routes. Um, Gabe, you want to give us a little insight on what we can expect with that? Sure. Um, we're at a point now where we're, we're getting asked, OK, what is this going to look like? What's the big picture for bus rapid transit? And uh, we have our test line. We've got the uh, east-west central BRT well thought out and on its way to construction. We're in the alternatives analysis phase uh, for Western Ashland. And so it's time to start looking back at that central area plan. Um, and it's time to start also looking citywide at how BRT can integrate with our entire transportation system um, with all of the CTA, Metra, uh, 
and other modes, basically. And so that'll kick off uh, this year, and Chris will make sure that it's done in about a year, right, Chris? Yeah. Question over here? Question for Rebecca or An Gabe, and that Introduce is yourself real quick, Chris. a quick question. Uh, incremental riders. We're not. Chris Roebling. Oh, my name's Chris Roebling, sorry. Uh, incremental riders from any of the lines that you've discussed, what are you looking at? What, what are you anticipating as of today? And then what are you doing to keep operating costs in line? Where do the operating costs come out? Uh, at, at what percentage of the current? And, and what steps are you taking to keep those in control? I mean, I'll just say broadly that uh, BRT lowers operating costs because you're talking about speeding up the buses considerably. And when you speed up the buses, you need to run less buses. Um, so that's a good thing overall. But in terms of the, the detailed numbers per line, I'd have to let, let Rebecca, and I, I don't know if you have that with you. Let me just say a couple things to elaborate. Uh, so as Gabe noted, it is a much more efficient operation. If we're moving faster, you need less buses overall to meet the same service levels just because you're moving faster through that circulation route. Um, but of course, we do expect uh, that, especially with corridors like Ashland and Western, there's opportunity for significant growth. And so uh, if we're so lucky, we're going to be in the situation where we're actually adding more service um, because not only do we want those headways to be shorter and have more frequent uh, service and less wait time in between bus arrivals, uh, we expect to have growth on the corridor and we'll need more capacity uh, and, and the number of buses too. So we would drive those operational efficiencies back into more service or just overall in terms of um, reduced operating costs for the system. Um, I don't remember offhand, maybe Joe can answer what the projected growth is for Ashland and Western in terms of the kind of crossover. But um, certainly in the central loop corridor, we think that there is a lot of more opportunity for growth from commuters coming in from the Union Station area and going across town. If we can show that bus travel across the loop is a faster, more reliable mode than hopping in a cab, well, we expect there's a great market there. You know, right now, buses in the loop are going three to five miles per hour. So if we can speed that up to 12 to 15 miles per hour, that's a huge change. Okay, we've got another question on the inside row here. And while the mic is coming to you, um, Nick, you, uh, not that I'm trying to refocus your attention away from Chicago, but Rockefeller is working with some other cities as well. Do you want to quick give us a preview of who they are or what they're up to? Yes, I'm happy to. So, th although I will say, and uh, uh, again, it's not to gild the lily, that no place is as advanced as Chicago is uh, in terms of in terms of this work. Um, but we are. <laughs> And frankly, do credit to you all and really, and, and also to the Chicago Community Trust that has really been the, the local lead here uh, in terms of putting together the, the BRT steering committee and um, herding the cats, as you said. They're a bunch of very influential and smart cats and a lot of really... <laughs> <laughs> cool cats. Uh. Cool cats, right. I, I mean that in the, uh, right, in the most archaic sense. Um, but in any event, we are all, we're supporting work in Montgomery County, uh, Maryland, which is the, a suburb right to the north of, of Washington, D.C. That's a very interesting um, effort because Montgomery County, is, it's, uh, it is the 13th richest county in the United States. Uh, it has about a million people in it, and but it's the population is changing very quickly. It, it just it went majority and minority uh, about three years ago. You have a lot of people living on the east side of the county, and then a lot of the jobs on the west side, and no way of getting across. Um, across the Potomac River is Fairfax County, which is getting the Silver Line extension of the of Metro, which is Metro out to Dulles Airport. And many of you might be familiar with the fact that Tyson's Corner is really um, sort of reinventing itself. That's a, that is a, what was once a, sort of a horrible shopping district in, in Northern Virginia that is now going to become you know, sort of the, the classic example of a suburban sort of smart growth built around transit. And the folks in Montgomery County know that they're never going to get a, a silver line and they need to have 
uh, they need to have a very reliable transit system um, in order to continue to develop. Um, so that's why they're looking at bus rapid transit. And then we're also doing a little bit of work in Nashville and Boston and Pittsburgh. Thank you, thank you for that. And question um, in the corner, please. If I could just round out the answer to the question before I found statistics. For the current modeling on West, Western and Ashland would project up to 30% in increased transit use. So you've already got 30,000 a day, average weekday, using each of those corridors. So that could be up to 10,000 more people um, using the, the BRT system than compared to the current local bus service. Thanks. Thank you for that. Please. Oh, hi, my name is Isabel Velez. My question is um, more about the buses itself and the long-term plan, um, which are the, they're going to be the same buses that we use now, and is there any long-term plan to turn them into maybe electric buses or a light rail that will be more environmentally friendly and maybe cost-efficient? Uh, I'll say some of that is impacted by the concept that we choose in terms of how the roadway should be designed. Right now, our, our local bus is obviously run on the curbside. For those of you that have been following our, our screening process on the alternatives analysis for Western and Ashland, you'll see we've considered both curbside operations as well as center running. In my presentation, I showed some renderings of what center running looks like, and that would necessitate a different type of bus than we use for a local bus service today because you'd need to have buses with left opening doors and most likely you'd have buses with doors on both sides of the bus so that they can operate in dedicated lanes like that but also in regular uh, curbside local service as well. So uh, a lot of the decisions about the final the fleet that would be used for Ashland and Western in particular are, are still um, on the table. Uh, I think we're not looking at light rail. I mean this is really the, a very high standard BRT is what our goal would be here versus our traditional elevated system um, that's heavy rail. And uh, definitely there would be distinct branding for all of the BRT routes. If you've seen the Jeffrey Jump, again, we've wrapped those buses in a way that make them look very different from regular local bus service to really say this is something different, it operates different, it, it delivers something different, and it distinguishes it from the local bus service. So I would. Ex any, any BRT routes are going to be branded differently. And then in terms of, there's a, there's a lot of room on the spectrum for other types of enhancements, you know, three doors instead of two doors, those types of things that are all driven by analysis of capacity needs uh, on the corridor in particular. Gabe, do you want to add? No, I mean, I, I guess I would just say I think it is important for it to be distinctive. Uh, and even more importantly, it needs to be functionally different. But from the, there's a whole marketing uh, element to this project. Um, and, you know, you may well see completely different buses, but we just haven't gotten there yet. Okay, we have a question over here, and then we'll come back over to Phil. Okay. Yeah. My name is Gail Spreen. I'm with SOAR, the Streeterville Organization of Active Residents. I have two questions. Um, one is, are you going to be limiting the number of stops? Like right now you have bus stops like almost every block. So how far apart will the bus stops be? And the other question is the hours that they will be running. Because if they're running to Navy Pier, they need, you know, it's not so much necessarily the commuter all the time. It's going to be, you know, the tourist. So I'll say generically in terms of when we look at BRT in comparison to our regular local bus service, our service standards are for most buses they're stopping um, an eighth of a mile. In some cases, the, the more subject express service, it's a quarter of a mile. The goal for BRT is to function again more like a rail line, so that's like half mile stop spacing. Um, so every in Chicago that would be four standard city blocks. So you're at most two blocks away, <laughs> the longest walk from a stop. Um, so in terms of the specifics about the 124, in terms of how that may change at this point, um, we're really expecting a lot of the improvements to come from the improved speed through the central loop there. That's, we're not talking about you know, eliminating stops. It's just about moving through that corridor more quickly. Um, all of the, those final decisions about the bus stop locations and you know, hours of service and frequency of service will be things that are c continuing into the final design process that CDOT is embarking on now in partnership with, with CTA. And like any bus route, whether it be a local route or BRT route, we on a regular basis are reviewing what are the ridership travel patterns and the, the ridership demands in terms of the hours of service and the frequency of service and looking to adjust that on a regular basis. Because we want riders and we appreciate your business. Uh, Kyle, once you make your way over by the camera, Phil's got his hand up, 
And uh, while Cal's coming with the microphone, Gabe, can you just address how um, enforcement of these lanes might occur? Mm -hmm. Nick showed some great pictures from New York where enforcement, the, where the cops were strictly enforcing the lane, making sure nobody yes. went in there, <laughs> right? So they enforce right. it very well in New York. Will we have the same here? Well, yeah, and there's a couple different ways that we might do that. But if you look at what's happened with the uh, Jeffrey Jump, where we had a pretty amazing uh, coordinated effort between CTA and CDOT and Streets and Sand and um, CPD. Um, it worked extremely well where you go in at the beginning and you have uh, very aggressive enforcement for the first few weeks. Then you do targeted enforcement after that, maybe on a monthly basis. And uh, it's worked very well and there haven't been any problems. People learn quickly when they get a ticket. But even, you know, more importantly, before that, there was a lot of education, a lot of leafleting at you know, people's houses, on their cars, so there weren't even that many tickets given out. Um, uh, there's obviously ways to utilize technology. Um, I don't know if we'll need to even go there, though. Thank you. Uh, Phil? Yeah, uh, Phil Levin, the plan planning director of the Greater North Michigan Avenue Association. Question for Rebecca. About three years ago, with the discussion of uh, congestion pricing in the downtown area, there was a plan for a uh, BRT on Chicago Avenue, which would connect up the uh, red line, the brown line, and the blue line station. So somebody coming in from O'Hare could get off at Milwaukee and Chicago Avenue, take the BRT uh, to the North Michigan Avenue area, where right now somebody would have to come in to the loop and try and figure out how to get to a hotel or a business uh, up on North Michigan Avenue. Is the Chicago Avenue BRT somewhere in the planning? and? If not, what can we do to work with you to uh, uh, see if that can be um, you know, put part of the program? So Gabe mentioned that CDOT is leading an effort this year to do a system-wide, like Chicago system-wide network plan for BRT and where the next wave of implementation or the next several waves of implementation could be so you end up with a, a general scheme for the city that the three uh, projects we have going now fit into that larger network. Uh, I'll say Chicago is a great candidate um, for BRT from a CTA ridership perspective. It's one of our top routes um, and certainly that type of connectivity that you suggested in terms of air, uh, air travelers coming into the River North area, that's exactly the type of application that BRT is great for because it allows us to create that connectivity without creating another elevated line um, and gives us more flexibility long term and can be more quickly implemented. Um, as the overall system network plan is produced, a lot of what will go into that is evaluation of current ridership patterns, but also things like street geometrics. So um, is Chicago Avenue wide enough to accommodate the dedicated lanes? Um, or, you know, Chicago is not a great example, but others are, are there too many viaducts in terms of freight rail crossings overhead? And, and all of that goes into a concerted effort to lay out the next vision for expansion of BRT. And I would just add to that, um, there's, you know, Carroll Avenue that's been studied. Um, we also have to look at the adjacent land uses now, um, which have changed. You know, Carroll Ave may or may not be a, a great spot anymore. Um, but we're well aware of the need up there. Um, whether it's on Michigan Avenue or east-west, there's definitely uh, a lot of density. Um, it's heavily trafficked and it's just going to get busier and busier. Oh, and I would just mention that we also have just uh, started to kick off our North Lakeshore Drive study, um, which also will look at the potentials for bus rapid transit on Lakeshore Drive. I think that's probably the last question we have time for right now, but is there any final comments from members of the panel you want to make before we conclude? Gabe always has something to say. Thank you, Peter Scozzi. <laughs> that's a great final comment. Anything else? <laughs> Um, thank you. Obviously, this is, uh, I, I want to thank the, the partners at the table, the partners at On Steering Committee, MPC in particular for hosting, but all of you can be ambassadors in terms of helping to educate the public about the opportunities we have here. Obviously, no one likes change um, and anything this transformative, there's a lot of questions that go along with it. And so we thank you in advance for helping to be ambassadors to really lay out the argument for why this is important for our region. 
And I will just build on what Rebecca said. Uh, you can continue to stay involved. I already mentioned uh, mandatory, obligatory sign up for Streets Blog, which you will all do. Uh, if you leave us your business card in the fishbowl at the front table, we will sign you up for our newsletter, which includes Talking Transit, so you can get updates about transit innovations in Chicago and around the world. Uh, and you can always follow us in, on Twitter and friend us on Facebook. Um, please, 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 before you leave, there is a survey on your seat sheet. You know what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> fill it out if you would. We greatly value that input. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we do a lot of these events and we shape them. Uh, any comments, fair game. If the little boxes or questions are too restrictive, just scrawl whatever you like on there. Um, please fill that out. And then I also beg your indulgence too. We have another meeting beginning at 2 o'clock, so we would appreciate you to fill it out quickly. Um, and then leave it, uh, leave it either on the front table or hand it to one of the staff as you go. Thank you so much for coming. Let's give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you.